Amen. Take your Bibles this morning, if you would. We're going to begin a short Christmas series that we're calling Born to Die. The next three weeks, we'll be preaching three messages called Christmas, Cross, Crown, all taken from this passage in Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11. And then on Sunday, December 25th, I hope you realize, and if not, you will today, that Christmas falls on a Sunday this year. We will gather at 1045 right here on Christmas morning for our annual Calvary Hill Christmas service. Looking forward to that. I'm not sure how many years ago it was that we had Christmas uh, together on a Sunday morning, but it's been some time, and it'll be some time again before we do it. Philippians chapter 2, this morning we'll look at verses 5 through 7, so let's, let's read those together. If you don't have a Bible in front of you, I believe the words will be on the screen here at the front. Paul, of course, is writing, and in Philippians 2 verse 5 he says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. We're going to stop right there. Let's pray. Father, we ask you today in the name of Jesus that you would help us to take you at your word to believe what you have told us is true, to think of ourselves and of others, even as Christ Jesus thought of himself and others, to see you in light of your word, to honor you in obedience to your word. So we simply ask you today, Father, as we have asked you on countless other occasions, to open our hearts, speak to us, transform us this morning. And as always, Father, we pray that if there is someone here, someone watching from home that does not know Christ as Savior and Lord, that today would be a day of salvation for that one. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Philippians chapter 2 is not a passage that I typically think of when I think of uh, Christmas. But uh, nonetheless, these verses that we're going to be looking at over the next few weeks uh, paint a beautiful picture of what Christmas is really all about. And isn't that what we all are trying to kind of get our fingers on uh, this time of year? I mean, every Christmas movie that I guess has ever been produced has had the underlying theme of what Christmas is really supposed to be about, finding the true meaning of Christmas. Well, let me just assure you that the only place you really need to look to find the true meaning of Christmas is right here in the Word of God. Uh, this is where you find the true meaning of Christmas. And, uh, and Paul, of course, uh, shares it right here in these few verses that we will consider over the next few weeks. He says in verse 5, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. And of course, he's referring to what he has said in the previous couple uh, of verses uh, when he, he says that. Uh, I have entitled this first point of the, of the message, The Genius of Christmas. And what I mean by that is not what we typically think of when we think of the word genius. I mean, most of the time when we use that word genius, we are referring to someone of a superior mind or superior mental capacity. Someone like Albert Einstein, Stephen Hawking, those guys we would refer to as, as genius. But What I am using that word to represent this morning in this message is the distinctive identifying character or spirit of Christmas. Uh, The spirit of Christmas, the genius of Christmas is really a 
a state of mind. It is a way of thinking, uh, which Paul says here uh, is yours in Christ Jesus. So in other words, in order to truly have the spirit of Christmas, in order to think the way that Christ thought when he thought of others, uh, we have to know him. We have to be in a relationship with him. This, this manner of thinking, this mindset that uh, Paul is advocating here is something that is only available to those in Christ. Uh, if you know Jesus, then you can have this mind uh, in yourself that is yours in Christ Jesus. Again, it's, it's a way of thinking, as Paul says here, that causes a person to look not only to his own interests, but to the interests of others. That's what he says in verse 4. Let each of you look not only to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Uh, I know that historically for me, Christmas has been a time of looking to my own interests. As long as I can remember, uh, Christmas was all about making a list, right, of the things that I wanted to get for Christmas. Uh, waking up on Christmas morning, rushing to the tree to see if I indeed received the things that were on my list. Uh, but the Bible teaches us that Christmas is much more than that. It's thinking about the interests of others, taking the interests of others into consideration, as well as the interests of yourself. In other words, if we're thinking rightly about Christmas, we will be thinking, first and foremost, about others. Isn't that what Jesus did? I'm so thankful that Jesus thought of me, thought of us. I mean, can you imagine that? Jesus is the one that spoke the universe into existence. The Bible says that everything was made by him and was made for him. That, that by his power, he supports and sustains all of his creation. Can you imagine what a big job that must be? And yet in the midst of all of that, he thought of us. Uh, Christmas and the Christmas season can be a very busy time. I just want to encourage you to slow down enough to look around and to think of others. This is a time that we will be thinking, as we've said in our Thanksgiving message, about giving and not just about receiving. Really, this mindset of Christmas, uh, this mind that is to be in us, that is ours in Christ Jesus, uh, is summed up by the words of Jesus. You know, according to Acts chapter 20, verse 35, Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And the question is, do we really believe that? We should. It's God's word. More blessed to give than to receive. Again, that word blessed speaks of happiness, joy, delight. It is more joyful. It makes us happier to give than to receive. But how easy it is for us to lose sight of that in the hustle and bustle of Christmas. Have this mind among yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, or which is yours in Christ Jesus. Uh, if there's one thing that we should be praying for this Christmas is that we would think and live more like Jesus thought and lived. That we would view others as Jesus viewed others. Again, that we would truly embrace the truth that it's more blessed to give than to receive. That's the, that's the true genius of Christmas, the true spirit of Christmas. And then I, I want to talk this morning about the glory of Christmas. The scripture says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, and now we're going to talk about how Jesus expressed this mind, this way of thinking, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God 
a thing to be grasped. Now, we've already made it very clear that Christmas is all about God sending Jesus, His Son, and our Savior into the world. I mean, that's what Christmas is all about. We celebrate the birth, the coming of Jesus Christ into the world. But the glory of Christmas that I want us to, to see or to grasp this morning is really all about who Jesus is and where Jesus came from. Uh, yeah, he was born of the Virgin Mary in that stable, uh, laid in that manger. Uh, but you've got to remember who he is and where he came from. The glory of Christmas is this, as the writer of Hebrews said, that Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. You see, Jesus is not only the one that was sent by God. As Paul claims here, he is God himself. He says, who, though he was in the form of God. The word was, by the way, and I, I probably thought I was going to start with the word form. I'm going to start with the word was. That word could be translated existed. Who, though he existed in the form of God. It's a word that speaks of the unchangeable nature of Jesus. Now, the word form refers to the outward manifestation of a thing but also of its inward reality. Uh, Jesus, again, according to Paul, was God. And that's what, that's what he's claiming here. That Jesus is, that Jesus always was and always will be God. He is eternally, that's, that's the word eternal, right? Jesus is eternally God. He was God before the foundation of the world. He is God. He will always be God. Inside and out, through and through, from top to bottom, Jesus is God. That's what makes his coming into the world so glorious. This wasn't just any baby born to any woman. This was God, God the Son, coming to earth for us eternally God. And of course, that means that Jesus came, as we saw this morning on the video, he came from heaven. We need to think about that for a moment. He was indeed willing to, to come down, uh, to enter into this messy world in which we live. And he came from the glories of heaven. Not only was he eternally God, but Paul also claims that Jesus is equally God. He was in the form of God, and he was equal with God. There is no hierarchy within the Godhead. I think that we get this idea that somehow God the Father is superior to God the Son, who in turn is superior to God the Holy Spirit. I mean, isn't that the way we most often think of it? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We need to flatten that out. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three in one, co-eternal, co-equal. There is no hierarchy in the Godhead. Uh, the word equality here means the exact equivalence. Jesus did not count his exact equivalence with God something to be grasped, the scripture says. The word equality is in its plural form, again, indicating that in every aspect, in every attribute, God the Son is equal to God the Father. Anything that you could say about God the Father, you can say about God the Son. And God the Spirit, Holy Spirit for that matter. This is exactly what Jesus meant when he claimed, I and the Father are one. Or, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus was claiming equality with God. That's why these words, though they comfort our hearts and encourage us, uh, 
boy, they brought uh, anger uh, from those who heard them in the early days of his ministry. He was claiming equality with the Father. And ultimately, that was the, uh, the claim that got him crucified. So, Jesus is eternally and equally God. And yet, in spite of that, as the Scripture says, he refused or, or he did not see these things as something to be grasped. Uh, and again, what that means is simply this, is that he could have taken advantage. Again, as the video showed us up there, this is, this is he was the God of all power. Uh, he was the God of splendor and glory. He, he, he could have lived any way he chose to live. He could have come in any form that he chose to come, but he refused to take advantage of his privileged positions in order to further his own interests. But rather, he used that power. He used that glory. He used that might to further the interests of others. He left the glory of heaven. He laid aside the glory that he shared with the Father. And he came to earth in order to seek and to save that which was lost. To serve rather than to be served. To lay down his life for his friends. That's the glory of Christmas. Jesus came not for himself, but he came for us. To save us from our sins. To die for us in order that we might truly live. He was in the form of God. Inwardly, outwardly, God. He was equal with God from all eternity. But he didn't consider these things something to be grasped, be used for his own advantage. But rather, he used all of his power, all of his position to use it for our advantage. Verse 7 says he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men. And this is the gift of Christmas. And just in case you're Wondering, the gift of Christmas is Jesus. You know, we tend to think of Christmas gifts as things like gold, frankincense, and myrrh, right? The gifts that the wise men brought to Jesus from their treasures. But Jesus himself, he is the long-awaited gift sent from the Father. I, I love Isaiah chapter 9. It speaks of this gift from the Father let me just read this to you. Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 9, beginning in verse 2, the Bible says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. That's, that's Jesus, by the way. Those who have dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shone. You've multiplied the nations. You have increased its joy. They rejoice in you as with the joy of harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff, for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken, as on the day of Midian, for every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult, and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. And then this wonderful promise, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Isaiah prophesied of the coming of the gift of Christmas this child that would be born, this son that would be given. And then, of course, the gifts that would be ours in him. In him, we would have a wonderful counselor. You know, I don't know about you, 
But there are times when I need to be encouraged. Times when I need to be comforted. Times when I need to be helped. It is so nice to know that in Christ I have this wonderful counselor. He is the mighty God. Aren't you glad that God has given us a mighty God? We need his strength in our lives. We need his wisdom and insight. We need his protection and his provision. All of these things we have in Christ, this child that is born, this son that is is given. He is our everlasting father. Isn't it good to know that the love of God the Father flows through him to us? You are loved this morning in Christ. He is the Prince of Peace. If there's one thing our world needs today, it's peace, right? Let me tell you, in Christ you have it. Jesus said uh, he was going to leave his peace with us. My peace I give to you. It's not a peace, Jesus said, that you can find in the world. It's his peace. It's the peace that he alone possesses, that he alone gives. He is the prince of peace. And indeed, the government and the peace that he provides within that government will see no end. Christ will sit upon the throne of his Father David, reigning over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it from this time forth and forevermore. You know, when we look at the governments of this world, the government of our own nation, I'm so thankful to know uh, that Jesus is the king, that Jesus is the one who sits upon the throne, that in Christ I have this wonderful gift, that the zeal of the Lord of hosts has done all of these things. As we prepare for Christmas, we must never lose sight of what the true gift of Christmas is. You know, in order to accomplish the Father's purpose in sending him, Paul writes here that Jesus emptied himself. Now, theologians have debated for centuries uh, the exact nature of this emptying. What does it mean that he emptied himself? Uh, And we don't have time this morning to get into all of the theories or all of the uh, questions and answers concerning this. But let me just say this. I want to assure you this morning that what these words do not mean is that Jesus laid aside his deity. Remember, he existed unchangeably, eternally in the form of God. All right? Jesus was God, Jesus is God, Jesus always will be God. So these words do not mean that he laid aside his deity. Again, Paul makes that absolutely clear. And Paul actually defines for us here how he's using that word. One of the things that we all need to learn, that I need to be reminded of time and again, is that so often the answer to our questions is right there in the Scripture. If you want to know what Paul meant by Jesus emptying himself, we just have to keep reading. He emptied himself by taking the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men. First, by taking the form of a servant. You know, Jesus said of himself, even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And you know, Jesus made that statement immediately after he had instructed his disciples with these words, that whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Did you know that right up until days before Christ's arrest and crucifixion, the disciples were arguing about who would be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? James and John, referred to in Scripture as the sons of thunder, actually sent their mother to Jesus to ask him if when he came into his kingdom, her two boys could sit on either side, one on his left and one on his right. 
We're not so different from these disciples, are we? Again, it is so easy for us to get our minds focused rather on the most important thing that's happening all around us. We get our mind on ourselves. Here Jesus was days before his crucifixion, days before dying for the sins of the world, days before his resurrection and his exaltation. And these guys were thinking about themselves and their place in the kingdom of God. Of God. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Whoever would be first among you must be your slave. You see, servants humble themselves in order to care for others, to carry the burdens of others. That's what a slave does. And and they often find themselves performing the most menial of tasks for others. And that's hard for us, isn't it? It's always been hard for mankind. We like people to care for us. We like people to look after us. We like people to do for us. But Jesus says, oh no, if you want to be great in my kingdom, you'll be a servant. In John chapter 13, Jesus demonstrated what it means to be a servant. He gave his disciples not just a picture, but an experience that I believe was forever drilled into their mind. And you remember the story. It was on that night of the Last Supper, right? When Jesus gathered with his disciples in the upper room, the night before his betrayal and arrest. And you know, in those days, people ate kind of, laying on their sides. They didn't have tables the way we have tables. They didn't eat at tables the way we eat at tables in chairs. They, they kind of reclined. As a matter of fact, the scriptures that we often read about Christmas and the Last Supper refer to them reclining at table. They would, they would kind of lay there on their sides. And of course, before they ever got to the table, every one of them did the same thing. Matter of fact, as they came into the house, they would take off their sandals. And that meant that whoever you happened to be seated by, or maybe you were a couple of people down from them, you'd be right by their feet. (laughs) Dirty, dusty, smelly feet as you were trying to eat dinner. So what typically happened when a person came into a household, the lowest slave within the house would clean the feet of the house guests. That didn't happen on this particular night. They they had borrowed this room from the man who owned the house. There was no servant to clean the feet of the disciples or to clean the feet of Jesus. And so in John chapter 3, the Bible says this. Said Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God. Now, think about that for a moment. Jesus knew who he was. Jesus knew who his Father was. Jesus knew where he had come from and where he was going back to. There was no question in Jesus' mind about the power, the glory, the majesty of who he was and where he came from. Jesus knew these things. But in spite of all that, John says that he rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garment and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around his waist. Scriptures there indicate that there was some shock and dismay from the disciples about what Jesus was doing. Remember, only the lowest servant within the house would be given the duty of washing the guests' feet. And as a matter of fact, this wasn't even allowed for Hebrews. Only pagan slaves could do this duty. But here Jesus, the very Son of God, washes the feet of his disciples. Then, of course, he instructs them to follow his example. Well, let me tell you, 
That's the instruction that he would give to us today, church. You do as you have seen me do. He emptied himself first by taking the form of a servant. Inside and out, he came to serve. Second, Paul says Jesus emptied himself by being born in the likeness of men. Again, it's uh, at Christmas, we celebrate the birth of Jesus. Uh, as we've made clear, Jesus was always God, is always God, will always be God. But he became a human at a point in history when he was conceived of the Holy Spirit in the Virgin Mary's womb. You know, in the opening chapter of his gospel, John says this, And the Word, referring to Jesus, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. At a point in time, 2,000 years ago, Jesus was born and laid in that manger. He became a human being. In becoming human, he was able to identify with us in every aspect. You know, I, I am thankful that Jesus can identify with me. Jesus knows the struggles that I endure, uh, the heartache that often accompanies my life. He knows the, the needs that I have because of my physical limitations. He experienced all of that as a human being. The writer of, of Hebrews says it this way, We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. We've got to remember, Jesus never sinned. He was not like us in that regard. But he understood our, our weaknesses, the, the human limitations that we have to live within. Jesus experienced that by coming into this world as the baby born in that manger. He grew up just like every other little boy grows up. He experienced everything that mankind experiences, again, yet without sin. So we have a Savior who can identify with us in every aspect of our life. And therefore, we should never feel like we're alone or that we're not understood. God knows us. He understands us. He's with us. Ultimately, of course, as the title of our series expresses, Jesus became human in order to die for us, that we might truly live. That's why he came. As Paul says in Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Jesus is the greatest Christmas gift. He is the gift of Christmas. And the Bible teaches us, this is from Psalm 37, 4, I'm going to paraphrase that, that verse in Psalms, but the Bible says, if you will find your joy in Him, that He will give you all that your heart desires. Could there be any greater Christmas gift than that? So as we move along through this Christmas season, my prayer for you is that you'll have the spirit of Christmas in every way. That your first thoughts will be of others and not yourself. That you'll remember that the true glory of Christmas is that the God of heaven came to earth to save you. And that there is no greater gift, no greater treasure that you can possess than Him. So again, if you have never received Christ, 
as your Savior and Lord. Never trusted him to save you. I pray that before this day is over, 